Welcome to Ultimate Marriage. Today we are talking about what biblical church looks like. We get this question all the time. What does biblical church look like? We um, plant and also pastor a biblical house church. And uh, what does that mean? And what does that look like? And how does that help our marriage? And how does that reflect on our family? And so we're going to answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. It's a giant topic. We mm-hmm. have a ministry, uh, relearnchurch.org. Uh, Ultimate Marriage is a companion ministry to relearnchurch.org. Um, and so uh, there's so much information there if you want to learn more about biblical church. Uh, we have it available there for you, and we're continuing to add more content. There. Yeah, and if this sparks interest, I encourage you to go there because there's no way we're going to be able to cover every little aspect of biblical church in this yeah, podcast. It's a big conversation. Mm-hmm. It's a, you know, we first titled Relearn Church, Unlearn Church, uh, but then decided to retitle it because I felt like there was some misconceptions about that name. But there very much is an unlearning and a relearning involved mm-hmm. in this process. And uh, hopefully this will be fruitful and possibly challenging for your journey. A um, couple things before we get started. Uh, y- this is a YouTube video. If you don't know, if you're just a podcast listener and you want to watch us live, not live, I guess recorded, yes. um, <laughs> you can watch us uh, uh, from YouTube and you know watch these in your house and watch them on people, watch them on their iPads and watch them as a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we'd love to have you guys there on YouTube as well. Um, and... If you're watching on YouTube, then would you subscribe to the podcast? And I'm going to make a big ask for you guys. Would you leave a review on the podcast? Just tap the stars on iTunes. You don't even need to write anything. But if you do write something, we will read it. But just tap the stars. Just rating the show. They really do help the exposure of the show. Um, Let's dive in to this conversation. Um, I might be talking a bit more than Veronica because this is... I think more my passion journey. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of like, I just feel like I've studied this a lot. Yeah. Um, but Veronica can bring a unique wifely perspective as kind of following me through this mm-hmm. and also not seeing the same vision or not seeing the vision so clearly. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit more cloudy on my end. <laughs> <laughs> well, just long ago. Now it's pretty clear. Yeah. But um, she followed me through some pretty weird things. Um, so why is biblical church so critical for biblical marriage? Like we're talking, this is a marriage podcast. Mm -hmm. And so why is biblical church so critical for biblical marriage? Um, the first thing is that the Bible says that our marriage should reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. His bride. His bride. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we don't partake in that relationship properly in the physical context, like the actual church in relationship with Christ, we're not going to be able to properly model it in context of our marriage. Because again, if you've heard this podcast, if you started from the beginning, you know that um, the relationship between a husband and wife is a metaphor, a visual parallel to the relationship between Christ and his bride. You can read about that in Ephesians chapter five. So having a physical experience in the church properly is critical for us to recreate that modeling that the Lord calls in Ephesians 5 in our actual marriage. So that's like the number one reason why biblical church and biblical marriage are so, you can't have one without the other Mm -hmm. because they model each other. Yeah, and another crucial aspect of biblical church is accountability. Huge accountability. And uh, of course, a lot of people, or a lot of our flesh hates that. Yeah. But um, accountability is huge. There are over a hundred one another's in scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, we're <clears throat> they are universal to the church um, and to be played out locally. Mm-hmm. And so um, we're called to know others, to bear one another's burdens, mm-hmm. to be known by them. Um, and the opposite of accountability is autonomy, which again our flesh absolutely loves. We yeah, love we the d- freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're a part of one body, not independent entities. Yeah. That's the, that's what the scriptural mandate. It, we, we are described as one body, not like independent Christian islands that are around here. And I like that you said that accountability because, 
um, we need accountability. Uh, we, it's so easy to hide in church, in institutional Christianity, because you're one of 300 or you're one of 3,000. Mm-hmm. You know, we came from that mega church world, and it's just... And it's easy to hide. Yeah, it's just easy to hide. Mm-hmm. It's just easy to, be, to get lost in the sea of people. And so the scriptures call for a much more integrated... Intimate relationship. Yeah, it, uh, right. and just mm-hmm. one deep one anothering, like just uh, obligation to each other that, that you don't necessarily experience in the institutionalized Christianity that we know, which I often t- call churchianity. It's just different than what you see in the scriptures. Uh, Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. And we, we have to realize that is that the church today is, is kind of built on the doctrines of distance in terms of we are really good at being present corporately but being alone independently. Like mm-hmm. we, we are just, we're not known. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're having so many issues in the church, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the other thing I'll bring up is protection. Um, you know, the Bible says there's safety in the abundance of counselors. That's a really prominent theme in terms of just their safety being known, having transparency, being vulnerable, confessing your sins to one another, praying for one another that you may be healed, mm-hmm. it says in James. Um, and so uh, protection on your marriage. Like the, <laughs> we have so much protection because we have so many people that care for our marriage. Yeah, and we're so involved in our our church that if somebody were to see like a red flag or you like one of us to speak dis- disrespectfully towards one another or whatever it is, it's very likely that somebody's going to approach us about it. Yeah, and and people have in the past, and, and that's we've that's the others. safety net. Yeah, because you don't want to start creating a habit of that. Yeah, and it, that become your new normal, and then before you know it, you guys are just at each other's throats. Well, and you hide it really well. We've seen couples that you know, yeah, they're, mm-hmm. they're, everything's great when you're in public, mm-hmm. you know. But when you're again, the smaller you get in terms of your gathering, the harder it is to hide. You might be able to hide it for a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months. But if you keep coming and you stay committed, you will be uh, revealed for for who you are, and and there's safety in that. Um, you know, church discipline, correction being rebuked, uh, being exhorted. Um, These are all God's gifts to us. They are like the bumpers on the bowling lane of life. You know, like (laughs) you just get to go and you go, boom, like God's saving you with these things. Mm -hmm. Um, Without those bumpers, you fall into the gutter. And that is, you know, sadly people isolate themselves and they just, that's how divorces happen. When you hear in a Bible study and you're in a Bible study for a year and all of a sudden a couple says, you know, we actually decided to get a divorce. And you're like, oh my gosh, we had no idea. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, we've been meeting for a whole year every single week, you know? So again, there's, there's some flaws that are going on in much of the, the church as always. Um, and we are trying our best. Um, I want to start with a big clarity point, um, before I go into the stats of the current church and why they need to be talked about. There's a big difference between talking bad about the, the bride of Christ, which we are not doing and pointing out and bringing identification to the problems that are within the church and calling for correction. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing here. Um, We would never talk bad about the bride of Christ, but we are absolutely to to talk um, about the things that man and people are doing inside the institution and the organism of the church that are not aligned with scripture. And to challenge those and go, okay, what we're doing isn't lining with what he's saying. And so um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, I think it's Second Timothy 4, 2. It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We are called to correct one another. Mm-hmm. And so uh, these things that we're going to talk about, we're not talking poorly about Christ's bride. We're talking about the things that we're doing as humans, as Christians, that are not aligning with Scripture, and the results that we are creating as a result of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Veronica is going to share some stats here in a second, but I'm going to just preface this section with, uh, these are the results that we're going to read about of the Western church. Now, the church throughout history has always had problems, but we need to face the reality of the results 
and they're not good right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's really easy for the church to say, look how much giving's happening and how many people were baptized. And, and we get to hear the, I guess, the highlight reel all the time. But when you look at the stats and the research, there is some bad things that are going on. We need to talk about those. And this is in America, which is the most religiously free society on the planet. We are talking about the country. These are the results in the country that has over 50,000 church buildings, Christian church buildings. Mm -hmm. That's like one for every 6,000 people. This is in the country with the most Bible colleges and seminaries in the world. Okay, so in this country with Christianity bursting at the seams in terms of the physical visual presence, these are the results. And so let's talk about those. Yeah. <clears throat> the results are pretty astonishing and sad. Um, so 79% of children raised in the church leave the faith by the time they're between 18 and 25. Just like stop there for a second. Yeah. Like th- <sighs> That's really sad. 79% of children raised in the church leave the faith between 18 and 25. Mm-hmm. We're losing 80% of the next generation to the world, to the other team, Mm -hmm. to Satan's camp. If that happened in any other institution where 80% failure rate, whoever was at the top of that organization (laughs) would be fired in terms of just, we would never allow that to occur anywhere else where 80% are falling away. Jesus chased the one out of the 99. We're, we're talking, it would be like 80, 80 of them are, are have left and Jesus is chasing all of them. I, this is a dilemma, a huge problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, next one is 42% of Christians have had a divorce. 64% of men look at pornography once per month. This is 64% of Christian men. Yeah. People, men claiming to be Christians. Yeah. That mm-hmm. are, are looking at pornography once per month there this is just mind-boggling to me 89 percent of christians have not read the entire bible 76 percent of christians do not know what the great commission is yeah so i want to talk about this 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 one so this is a stat this is two stats put together made up of the barna research group and they found out that 51 percent of christians these are regular evangelical christians have never even heard of the great commission i didn't for a long time until probably a few years ago yeah like it's, mm-hmm. you know, the mission. I, mean, I like when it was explained to me, I was like, oh yeah, like I know that, but I didn't understand that it was titled the Great Commission. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like the, the, the mission of the church, right? In Matthew mm-hmm. 28. And um, so 51% never even heard of it. Um, 25% had heard of it, but didn't know it was called the Great Commission. Mm-hmm. There you go. And so, so this is 76% of Christians don't know what the great commission is they, they don't they don't even know what they're here to do as a church like they, they just don't know so for those listening in who, who don't know can you tell them yeah so go into the you know if you turn to matthew 28 go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son of the holy spirit teaching them to obey all that i have commanded you and that's something that we need to have memorized it's that is what the great commission is that's what we're here to do okay Last one, 5% of Christians will share the gospel with one person once per year. Okay. Like, and we can share this even from our own experience. Mm -hmm. Like prior to being in biblical community, yeah, how often were you sharing the gospel with people? Never. Not at all. Yeah. And and it's, it's. I think I may have maybe one time ever in my Christian walk. And it's different from sharing your faith. A lot of people share your faith. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm a Christian. I just checked that box. I shared yeah. my faith. But presenting the gospel. Yeah, you're under God's wrath. And here is, you know, Jesus died for you. Like the, the, the full gospel. There's mm-hmm. a way out. Um, and that c- happens relationally. I don't want to say that it's just like street preaching here. But yeah. um, f- only 5% of Christians are sharing the gospel with one person per year. So y- you got a narrative here, right? So you go, mm-hmm. 89% of Christians haven't read the entire Bible which leads to the reality that 76% of Christians don't know what the Great Commission is, which leads to the reality that 5% of Christians will, um, will only share the gospel with one person per year. 
-hmm. which leads to this final point that you're going to make. Go ahead and read that. Yeah. <clears throat> that 1.5%, we're having a 1.5% decrease in American Christian population per year over the past 10 years. Yes. So that's a loss of 4.8 million identified Christians every 365 days. Christianity is shrinking in America. Mm -hmm. Um and we don't want to we don't want to face that reality, but but uh, there was a study done I think in 2015 during the census that every county in America there wasn't one county that grew an identified Christian population. Mhm. Mm so they all either stayed the same or decreased. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we are absolutely shrinking. These are the results of the current way of doing church. Okay. That, that's the results. Mm -hmm. Are we, are we going to sign up for another year of that? You know, that's the question. We, are we going to just keep doing what we're doing? I, I just, you know, I, I have friends again, who are pastors of churches that almost every Christian church I go to, is 90% the same and 10% different. Mm -hmm. And everybody's trying to do good things. But I think we have to look, step back and go, wait, wait a second. Are, is what we're doing not working on a grand scale? And do we really need more church buildings? Like, do we need 50,150 buildings? Maybe that'll solve the problem? No. You know, uh, maybe it's because we're not worshiping hard enough. Like, do we need another Hillsong album? Like, is that what it is? We just need more worship music? You know, do, do we just need better musicians on stage? Do we need better sermon series? Like, is that it? We just need better sermons. You know. I, we just need people to follow God's word. Yes. And so the, the solution to biblical or to church revival is going back. To, to what scripture says. To what scripture says. Mm -hmm. um, and we're reaping what we've sowed. Mm -hmm. These are the results of a man-made model. A man-made model will never deliver Christ-like results. Okay, I'm just going to let you guys hear that again. A man-made model will never deliver Christ-like results. And if you're simply followed the Bible, like if you just forgot everything and we go, okay, Here's a Bible. I want you to read it and then start gathering as Christians. If, if you just did that and you use the Bible as your blueprint for how to create a church gathering, there is no way that you would end up with what we have today. Mm -hmm. Would you really end up with a big building with... Hundreds, thousands of hundreds, people. Thousands of people that are here for the music. Sitting, facing one person. One person's talking, mm -hmm. nobody talks to each other, kids get outsourced to children's ministries, children's ministries, youth group. Youth group. Like you, you would never get there. And this is the dilemma that we have to, to face and, and why we're talking about that. Um, Francis Chan is actually, you know, he, he just came out with a book called Letters to the Church. Um, and he's on the same journey for the past several years, probably very similar to our journey, like at the same timeline. Mm-hmm. He's planting biblical house churches and he's trying to figure out what that looks like. And we're kind of, I've talked and spoke with his team a few times and we're doing that with Relearn Church. We're planting biblical house churches. We're trying to look at the scriptures and go, what does the Bible say? Nothing more, and nothing less. Um, and I, yeah, I just uh, checked that out. Another book that you might want to check, up, check out, um, I think is important to read prior to reading Francis Chan's Letters to the Church is reading Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola and George Barna, Barna uh, in terms of Barna, the, the Barna Group, uh, the research company. Um, a couple things before Veronica is going to share our story. Um, unless you're kind of unaware, uh, but our experience is that a lot of Christians aren't going to church that much anymore. Mm -hmm. And if they are, they're they're feeling usually some type of tension in their spirit about how it's done in mm -hmm. some way or another. And they're not hyper committed. Like they're going, if everything worked out, you know, everybody got eight hours of sleep, everybody, nobody's sick. There's nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's kind of what, what's going on um, in the church. And that's just our experience. Um, the interesting thing is that 
while thousands of Christians are actually leaving the church and in search for the biblical church, um, they, they, these people that are leaving the church, these Christians that are leaving the church, they don't want less Jesus. They want more Jesus. They're just not finding him there. Mm-hmm. And so this is, this is an issue, guys. What I'm saying is that the very place that is supposed to represent the good shepherd, the church of Jesus Christ, the very place that represents the good shepherd is leaving Christians, leaving sheep hungry, lost, and morally confused. Like, what are the most pressing moral issues of the day? Uh, I'm going to say them. Homosexuality, gender, abortion. Pornography. Pornography, suicide. Okay, these are the, the, the issues mm-hmm. of today. How many pastors are talking about those on the weekends? I mean... Very not, few. I mean, I, I don't want to say that none, none of them yeah. are because... There are some out there, but it's few and far between. Yeah, and we we and the reason that that we're afraid to talk about those things is that in the institutional model, you don't know if the guy in the back row is from the New York Times. And so, when you want to take a stand biblically on one of these moral issues, uh, the fear of man falls in, mm-hmm. and that happens. Um, and so what we have here is we have a, a, an institution that's a little bit more, it's, it's more extra biblical than it is biblical. And it's more like a corporation than it is the Church of Jesus Christ. We've made this that way. There's a quote, I don't know who said it. Um, I wish I did. I tried looking it up before, but this quote says, the man in the beginning builds the institution, but then the institution builds the man. And we've built the church and now the church is building us. And um, um, we just, this tradition, it's powerful stuff. That Doing the same thing over and over, it's hard to even question the system. Like, am I doing something that's actually not in the Bible? You know, the idea of one pastor preaching week after week after week, you're not going to find that in Scripture. Sunday school, age-segregated ministries, they don't exist in the Bible. And there's a quote from R.C. Ryle. He says, this is, uh, I think he's late 1800s. When traditions are first called into being, they are useful. Then they become necessary. And at last, they are too often made idols. And all must bow down to them or be punished. Um, One last thing I'll say before we share our story is Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says to his disciples who are saying, look at those other people over there doing other things that are different than us in your name. And Jesus said to the disciples, if they're not against us, they're for us. And so a heart of unity without desiring uniformity is important. Jesus is doing work in the institutional church. Mm -hmm. By no means am I saying that whatever thing's going on over there is wrong. But as Christians, we should be looking to do what the most biblical and most fruitful expression of gathering. That is our aim. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So I'll let Veronica Mm. share a bit of our story here. Yeah, so... Yeah, I'll just, I guess, start from the very beginning. Um, Dale and I, when we started dating, um, I was going to a mega church down in Southern California, and you're going to a smaller mega church. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when we started dating, I'd go and visit your church a couple times. You'd come and visit mine. And that very first time you came and visited, you were instantly just kind of like taken back and looking around and. You just kept saying, like, something just doesn't feel right. Something is off. And I was just like, oh, okay, like, whatever. Remember those lanterns on the walls? Yes, I remember. <laughs> sure, sure about that. Um, there was these massive lights um, all over the church building. It was, this is a brand new building. Our church had just moved into that building. Um, massive, massive building. And these lanterns were all over the church building. And they were probably, like, as tall as me. I'm five yeah. one, <laughs> So, like, five feet and three feet in in like circumference or something. And it was just, they're just these huge lanterns. Yeah. There's like a hundred of them. Yeah. And he's just like this one lantern probably costs, I don't know. 5,000 bucks. Yeah. Something like that. So anyway, he just kept 
And then, you know, he'd come and visit a few times here and there. And you're just like, I don't know, like something my spirit just doesn't feel right about it. And I was just very less like, okay, like, well, this is, this is, I didn't like, I didn't see it at that time. And neither um, did I. You saw, you knew something was off, but you didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we dated, um, we got, and then once we got engaged, got married, we decided to go, we're, we were, we came from mega churches and you were just like, you know, we just need to go to a smaller church. Mm-hmm. That'll fix the problem. Like we should go to a smaller church. Um, so we went to a smaller church and then with like a hundred people, maybe 200 people max, no, probably like a hundred, 150. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So then we went to a smaller church and you're just like, okay, this feels more right, but it still doesn't feel right. Yeah, because the <laughs> problem with every small church is that they really want to be a big church. Mm-hmm. And, and and so that DNA rooted down, they, they don't want to multiply and, and split. They want to they keep getting bigger and a bigger campus they and a bigger building. May, maybe grow, yeah. And so, yeah, you were still like, uh, and so after that, then we went back to a different mega church, massive church. Um, and we were there for, I don't know, a year maybe. Um, and then it finally got to, did you read the book first before we stopped going there? I did. So then, yeah. So then he, this book, Pagan Christianity caught his attention. You read it and then you're just like, okay, like we just can't go anymore. You almost felt like convicted for even going. Yeah. (laughs) I was just really struggling with, and I'm not saying that's correct, but I really do feel like the Lord called us at that point specifically called us out. I don't think he calls everybody out the way he called us out. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, So we stopped going to church altogether for probably three years, two or three years. Um, And it was just a season of just kind of walking in the desert Mm -hmm. of not really knowing what to do and kind of trying to do Bible studies and trying to do uh, a home church. But we had no example of what a home church was and so it just kind of disintegrated and fell apart and then um we had shortly after we had moved to oregon Mm -hmm. um and we went to our friend's son's birthday party um and we had heard about their authors and her literary agent um, was a pastor of a home church Mm -hmm. and we had heard about him multiple times and then we're just like, oh yeah, like we'd love to meet him because it was definitely something that we had we had already been on this journey for several years. Um, just didn't know how to get. Yeah, like I had in. the head knowledge, but mm-hmm. you can't. It's very difficult to create what you haven't seen or mm-hmm. experienced before. Yeah, and that's why I said when every time we did it, just kind of fell apart. Mm-hmm. And so we're like, yeah, we'd love to meet him and love to get to know him. Like he's been doing this for years and years. Like, show us the way, <laughs> kind of thing. And so we met him at our friend's birthday party. Um, got to know him. His daughter started babysitting Aria because we only had Aria at the time. Um, and then got to know him and his wife. We've been to several, several dinners. Um, and eventually got invited to go um, several months later. Um, and then we joined the Home Fellowship. Mm-hmm. And we were there for probably three years. Mm-hmm. And then... And, and in those three years, you especially were being discipled by um, this gentleman that I'm speaking of in the home fellowship, um, and he was training you up, and then you started having this desire on your heart to plant churches, and so he started training you up in specifically in that area. Um, and then there was countless Bible studies in that, too. I was being discipled by his wife, um, and then eventually we were sent off to plant a home church. Yeah, and so, so we were trained and discipled specifically yeah, to multiply off and mm-hmm. to create another church, to grow other people and to multiply and create another church and multiply and create another church and multiply and create another church. Yeah, and so um, we, Dill, now kind of pastors um, our home fellowship. Yep. And it started off with just us and another family that was with the other fellowship came with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Dale's parents mm-hmm. and it started off with just us three. Oh, and then there was another couple there that they had left and yeah and then they had left um and then it's just slowly grown right before we started the home fellowship you were teaching an apologetics class mm-hmm. for young adults and so um a couple of the young adults from that came and so it's a very small home home church gathering there's probably i don't know eight 
families think, or eight so. Eight families and a, yeah, a couple singles, and mm-hmm. so it's it's very small and and uh, you know, if that doubled in size, we'd be really thinking seriously about multiplication and figuring out a way to like intimacy. What the the job of a of a overseer, a shepherd, a pastor is to sense when intimacy is lost, when you can no longer fulfill the one another's. Uh, just for an example, let's just say that you're in a church with. 12 families okay i'm using families because it's easier for the example 12 families if you wanted to have one dinner per month with everybody in your church you'd have to have 12 dinners that's three a week and that's not even counting if you want to have a dinner with anybody else or anybody that's outside of your church like that's a lot that's just to see each other once so keeping it small and intimate is again, you know, we see that model with Jesus having 12 disciples. Uh, He spoke to thousands, but he discipled 12. Yeah. And so looking back um, on the earlier days of our journey with ending up in a a home fellowship, um, we had realized that we just kind of became inactive spectators in this Mm -hmm. weekly event. Mm -hmm. And we would look at the Bible and read what the scripture says, and then look at church the way we knew it and said like this, this doesn't seem to make sense. This doesn't add up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that, that was kind of what drew us more into the, into this journey. Yeah. It felt like audience Christianity. Like mm-hmm. that's really what, what I think it feels like. And the, the reason what happens when it becomes audience Christianity is because you, you eventually start to realize I don't actually have a role to play here in this body. I, I come and watch something and sure you might be the greeter you know, the, the very small p- uh, percentage of people that might be a greeter or, you know, you might be on the worship team or you, you might have you helping know, children's helping ministry, children's or, ministry something. or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But again, um, for the most people, it's, I have no role here. And it, for an, if you go through that for enough time, you eventually realize, you know what? They record these. Let's just watch them from home. Or there's a simulcast or a live Mm-hmm. let's just watch it from home or listen to the podcast on Tuesday and you eventually stay home. And this is perfect. Satan's so good at his job in terms of just this isolate you, boom, pull you mm-hmm. out and pull you away. So now you don't even, you're not even connected and you're listening to the podcast pastor. Mm-hmm. Well, then you realize that, you know what? John Piper and Tim Keller are actually better pastors and teachers than my pastor. I'm going to just start listening to them instead. And then you just, all of a sudden, now you're listening to just some, teacher that you have no relationship with at all, no local ties with anybody else locally, and you become this isolated Christian, which is like a wolf separating someone from the uh, from a flock. Like you just isolate one. And that's exactly what's happening is that all these Christians are isolated and they don't know what to do. Well, and it's just like the scripture that you mentioned earlier on in the show, a man who isol- isolates himself seeks his own desire. Yeah. And and I know it's stressful because there's nothing more stressful than thinking about a problem that doesn't have a solution. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of families are like, I don't even know what to do. Like, what am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. What, what other alternative is there? For sure. We're definitely going to get people emailing us this after they listen to the show. Yeah, and I get people all the time. Can, mm-hmm. Where do I, how do I find a house church? Where mm-hmm. are they at? Well, they don't have websites. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, but relearnchurch.org, again, is all about helping people figure out how to do this. Um, so, um, this is a little bit longer of a show. We're going to just keep going just because it's, I think, uh, important. Um, so what does is, what is our biblical church look like? I'm going to kind of give you guys a, a rundown on that. Um, you know, so we look to the book of Acts, but we have to remember the book of Acts is descriptive of what happened. It's historical. It's not prescriptive doctrine. Um, and compared to like Timothy is got lots of prescriptive doctrine and it's prescriptive, not descriptive. Um, now, does that mean that we don't like highly regard that, descri- that, that um, example that we see in, in like Acts chapter two? No, we totally um, respect that and look at that. But we look at the book of Acts for our reference points. We look at book of first, first Corinthians, uh, chapter 14 specifically, first Timothy, Titus. These are all books that have a lot of ecclesiology, doctrine about the church, how to actually do that. Um, among the rest of the New Testament, but those are the main books that I think we reference a lot for structure and, and what, it to, what it's to look like. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a quote that I say often, and it's probably not even mine. I probably got it from someone else and it's been blended, but I've been <laughs> using it for so long. 
Uh, it's what you win people with is what you win people to. Okay, what you win people with is what you win people to. And the institutional church is really good at winning people with really good design, really good positive messages, really great music, really good childcare, really cool buildings. Like what you win people with is what you win people to. And you get yourself in the situation that you have to keep entertaining these people more and more and more to keep them there, to keep them there Mm -hmm. because you want them with that. The biblical church wins people with three things. It wins them with the gospel. It wins them with the Bible and it wins them with the covenant relationship with the body of Christ, the other church members, the relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's critical. Um, and so we, we, we try to win people with those things. And then we meet in homes, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, we meet in our house or whoever's house. And um, we start since, you know, when we multiplied off and started a home fellowship, we started in our own home just because that's what made sense. Um, but every eight weeks or so, we will switch to somebody else's house. And that's just kind of our own thing. That's not like you have to do it this way. Yeah. Um, so it gives other people to serve, and it also gives the person who's hosting a break. Yeah. Um, and then we also do, like, um, a potluck after mm-hmm. fellowship. And so that's m- that's more the fellowship time. Um, we eat together. We talk, hang out. Like a thing of chairs and stuff comes. and. Yeah, we have chairs. Um, we have, like, our song books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... You know, like you might put a g- thing together of plates and cups and like dishes that might go back and forth, whoever the host is. These are, again, things that we've done that just make practical sense. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, but why meeting in homes? You know, so meeting in homes forces us to have a uh, that kind of really connected, deeply intimate relationship that I think is missing in the church today. That family like call that you see in scripture. Homes offers the environment for that. Like if you're going to want to bear your soul down and cry in front of people, do you want to do that in a building or do you want to do that on someone's couch in their living room? There, there's something about a home that, that does lend itself to a more private, safe environment to be vulnerable, to be uh, connected, to be like that is the central focus of our lives as home. And so... Um, Beyond that, it's it just practically speaking, house gatherings, they, they alleviate the, uh, the real, uh, incorporation, becoming a nonprofit, like, you know, all, all that stuff, the legalities of that. Um, it reduces the risk of persecution. It is a universal structure. Everybody on the planet can do that. Not everybody can do the big box church. It doesn't work in persecuted areas. Go try to build one in Iran and see what happens. And so houses are a universal solution. And because we already have houses, we don't have to use the money to build buildings. And instead we can re um, distribute that money to spiritual needs Mm -hmm. and to needs of the, of the, of the church Mm -hmm. members of the body. Yeah. And things for the, for the church as a whole. Yeah. And so um, uh, just the overview again, our church gathering, it's a, it's, it's not, it's contributor focus, not consumer focus as you, you're not, it's contributor Christianity, not consumer Christianity. And so people are coming to contribute, mm-hmm. to bring something, to bring a song. Yeah, you're not coming to just be poured into week after week after week after week after week. Like you also come prepared to yeah. share a testimony or a teaching or whatever it is that, a song, whatever the Lord has placed on your heart. Yeah. Um, it's not just all about you receiving. Yeah, You yeah. are also there to give and to serve. Yes, and and it's this beautiful kind of relationship, Holy Spirit-led meeting that doesn't have this pre-programmed schedule or agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's highly committed. Um, there's a scripture that we're going to read later. Um, I'll read it right now. It's uh, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Um, it says, and let us consider one another. So again, just it, it's a call to consider one another, to care for one another. To stir up love and good works, like care for one another so that people start loving each other, so that people have good works, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, Mm -hmm. as is the manner of some. So I want to stop there for a second, is that 
this is the reason they were not assembling is because they were afraid to die. They were afraid of the persecution of assembling together. And it, the author of Hebrews is saying, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day, capital D, approaching. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're, I would say we're hyper committed um, to our gathering. And, and like, we, how often do we miss a, a church gathering? Like, somebody has to be sick. Yeah. If we're missing, like, yeah, we a plan a couple times a year. We plan our vacations. Our everything is around this because the priority of our life is the church gathering. Now, can we miss a church gathering? Sure, but everybody knows that the priority. Yeah, but exactly, you can. The body knows that that our heart is to be with them. Yeah. So I'm going to give the schedule outline, and then I'm actually going to close, and I think I'm going to move these questions that I have at the end to our next episode because I think you guys will really enjoy the answers. We'll just do a small series on this. Part two. Part two on this, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you the schedule of, of what we do. So we we get together uh, at 9.30, um, and everybody comes and hangs out, and everybody brings their food, and we, we fellowship. Um, we, we fellowship, and fellowship is different than friendship. Fellowship is we have something in common, and that's Christ, and we we participate with one another, and we love each other for about a half hour, and then we start our meeting. And that's you know the meeting of the saints, the gathering of the saints um, for the edification of the body to do the work of the ministry. These are the scriptural references that we're seeing. We start our meeting at 10 o'clock. Um, and then our meeting follows very much so a outline of around 1 Corinthians 14, um, chapters t- or verses 26 through 40. And um, this is an every member functioning body. Um, we'll have the man of the house. will open up the meeting in prayer. And then we just go, hey, does anybody have a testimony, a, a prayer request, a song? Um, a, a, you know, any of the men have a teaching? Uh, anything, you know, let all things be done for edification, for, for, for the building up of the saints. That is what it says in scripture. And you just be quiet. And talk about those those moments of quietness. Uh, yeah, I think if you're new there, it probably feels really awkward. Yeah. Because you're just like sitting there and there five like seconds go by, 15 seconds go by, 30 seconds go by, and nobody has said anything and you're just like sitting there staring. But then we're so used to it, we don't even realize it anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, there could be a minute, a couple minutes going by without anyone saying anything. And then all of a sudden, somebody will be prompted and be like, okay. I want to share this or whatever it is. Yeah, you let the Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting and fill this, fill the silence in the room. It's not my agenda or anybody's agenda on what's going to happen. And it's amazing when you step back and you let the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, you know, twenty seconds in, someone says, "Well, this week we had a hard week, and I want to share what happened and what we learned." And then all of a sudden, off of that, yeah, and the testimony from it. Yeah, someone shares a, 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 a an encouragement. Someone says, "You know what? Hey." I've, I've been through that before. I want to, let's open up the scripture and read it. And then you read the scripture. And then all of a sudden someone's over here saying, can we sing a song that I think really lines up with what we're talking about? And then a prayer request happens over here. And then it moves on to someone say, Hey, I prepared a teaching. And it's, you know, it's interesting because this teaching actually goes along with what every, what we just talked about. There's this beautiful cohesion with the meeting. Not always, but, but there's just this, we, we've even had moments that, yeah, people are like, like an undeniable string that was woven through the meeting. Mm-hmm. And we do that for an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, probably closer to an hour and a half. The maybe kids a little are longer. Our, the kids are at our feet. Kids are with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and All ages. <laughs> all ages, yeah. And then we, we kind of just sit in the living room and do this. And then we, um, we when it's clear that the, the meeting's over, you know, uh, we will do communion mm-hmm. and, uh, we trade off on guys leading communion, um, for the church and, um, we let the men serve their own families. And then that's just something we do based off of the extrapolation of scripture that we've studied. And then we close with some announcements and then we do fellowship and lunch and potluck for several hours. Yeah. A couple hours usually. And that's sometimes longer. I think that's actually where the heart of the ministry is 
There's yeah, it's, it's pretty much an all day thing. Not all day, but it definitely takes up most of our day yeah, on like Sundays. Three to five hours. Mm -hmm. And and you just really get deeply connected and private conversations can occur and you know, groups of people walk this way and guys are playing with the kids and I mean it's just it's just a fun time. And then it doesn't stop there. We actually at the end of the week will schedule coffees and date nights. Yeah, or you do the you have a weekly men's meeting with the men from the body. Yes. Um and you guys will do a weekly men's meeting. The women will generally get together. Um most of us are mothers and so it's harder to get together as often as the men. Um but we'll meet once a month with all of us together once a month and then we'll, you know, have those one off coffee dates or dinners here and there. Yeah. It's a real biblical community. You look at the book of Acts, you look at the scriptures and you're, you're actually seeing people committed, deep, rich relationships of people loving each other. Yeah. And we're in day, almost daily communication as well through like text message or we have a app Slack through mm -hmm. Slack, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and we're praying for one another, and um, you know, I'm. There's a young woman in our fellowship who is married, but uh, they don't have children yet. And a lot of times, she'll offer like, "Hey, can I watch your kids this week?" Or, "Hey, can I bring you dinner?" I'm like, yes, yes, you can. That yeah. would be a huge blessing. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and this happens all the time. And she's actually watching our daughter right now baking a pie with her because she mm -hmm. invited and she invited her over to do mm -hmm. that. And so there's just that beautiful committed participatory relationships that I think people are yearning for. Um, so part two of this, we're going to talk about answering a couple questions. Um, we'll probably add one more question, but what is, what do you do with the children and what does that look like mm -hmm. in a biblical church? How does giving work? That's going to be a big one. What does that <laughs> look like? And we'll probably maybe ask another question or two. Um, but again, more information if you want to learn about Relearn Church and our ministry and what we do on teaching people how to plant and establish biblical churches, just go to relearnchurch.org. Again, this is the kind of umbrella ministry of, uh, of ultimate marriage. And um, uh, we'll leave you with a memory verse. Veronica can read. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Awesome. I uh, want to remind you guys, Tuesday is coming up and it's Giving Tuesday. Um, I've never, ever marketed a Giving Tuesday because I've never been in the nonprofit space. This is the very first year that we actually have something to give to. And uh, we really do believe that the Lord has is, is put us in this ministry to teach people how to have biblical marriages, how to do biblical church. And if you are interested in um, supporting what we're doing, you can um, uh, go to relearnchurch.org forward slash donate, and we would be blessed by that. If you guys want to learn about the show notes of this episode, this is episode number 20, and it's available at ultimatemarriage.com. Just click on the podcast section. There's all the, there's the video. There's the actual audio of the show. You can download uh, everything you need, references to scripture. It's all there for you guys. Um, until that, next week. Until next week. <laughs> Thank ya. you guys for joining us. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Ultimate Marriage. If you're homesick for a stronger marriage, visit our website at ultimatemarriage.com and consider enrolling in our one-year online marriage mentor program. Also, if you're interested in learning more about building a better marriage, follow Veronica and I on social media, where each week we share tips, tricks, and lessons on building a biblical marriage. 